you might come here Sunday on a whim. Say your life broke down. The last good kiss you had was years ago. You walk these streets, laid out by the insane, past hotels that didn't last, bars that did, the tortured try of local drivers to accelerate their lives. Only churches are kept up. The jail turned 70 this year. Its only prisoner is always in, not knowing what he's done. The principle supporting business now is rage. Hatred of the various grays the mountain sends. Hatred of the mill, the silver bill repeal, the best liked girls who leave each year for Butte. One good restaurant and bars won't wipe the boredom out. The 1907 boom, eight going silver mines, a dance floor built on springs. All memory resolves itself in gaze. In panoramic green, you know the cattle eat. Or two stacks high above the town, two dead kilns, the huge mill and collapse for 50 years that won't finally fall down. Isn't this your life? That ancient kiss still burning out your eyes? Isn't this defeat so accurate the church bell simply seems a pure announcement? Ring and no one comes. Don't empty houses ring? Is our magnesium and scorn sufficient to support a town? Not just Phillipsburg, but towns full of towering blondes good jazz and booze the world will never let you have until the town you came from dies inside. Say no to yourself. The old man, 20 when the jail was built, still laughs, although his lips collapse. Someday soon, he says, I'll go to sleep and not wake up. You tell him no. You're talking to yourself. The car that brought you here still runs. The money you buy lunch with is silver, no matter where it's mined. And the girl who serves your food is slender, and her red hair lights the wall. I'm Cameron Macinides. Um, as introduced, I, am, I was the 2014 National Student Poet for the Southeast Region. The poem you just heard is Degrees of Gray in Phillipsburg by Richard Hugo. It's a very important poem to me. Um, I read it constantly. I have Richard Hugo's collected works on my shelf at home. Uh, whenever I open it, I want to read a new poem, but I always end up back on page 216, reading that same one for the 217th time. Um, but two years ago, I would have told you it was boring. It was incomprehensible, because until recently, I really really, really disliked poetry. Could not grasp it at all. So the question in is then, how did I get from there to here? I'll have to take you back two years. Uh, to my junior year of high school, I was accepted to the South Carolina Governor's School for the Arts and Humanities. It's a public residential high school in my home state um, that accepts students to come live on campus and study in the arts they're passionate about, giving them the resources and the community they need. I was accepted for creative writing, and I was really pumped, but definitely not for poetry. Um, I was into fiction at the time. I wanted to write a novel or several novels or whatever. Um, and so I took my fiction class first quarter, and I loved it. It was a lot of fun. Um, but poetry was looming. And to be honest, I was probably scared by the prospect of nine weeks with an intensive genre of writing I found no reward in. Um, so from the beginning, I told, I told myself I wouldn't commit too much. I wouldn't invest a whole lot of myself because I was afraid that would end up leading to uh, a sort of hurt at something I felt would be an inevitable failure. I was right about one thing. I failed. And I failed a lot. And I don't just mean failing on some sort of abstract level, like not understanding poems or not writing good poems, although I definitely was not writing good poems. Um, but I was failing on a, on a more tangible level. I was failing the class because one of the skills 
our poetry teacher, Mamie Morgan, wanted to emphasize was careful reading. When you read a poem and you don't understand a word or know a place, you look it up. And so she gave us quizzes to get our comprehension on that, see how much we had looked up. Um, and it just required the one skill of pulling out the dictionary or Googling something to see what it was. Um, but for the most part, my classmates and I weren't doing that. And so we failed the first quiz and the second quiz and the third quiz. After a week or two of this, uh, we were pretty frustrated and Mamie was frustrated with our lack of progress. Um, she told us that to be writers and to be poets, we had to commit ourselves to reading and to studying and to putting in work on the little details. Um, she didn't care if we disliked her for how hard she was on us, she said. She, everything she did was to open our eyes and broaden our minds and get us to really think about the work we were doing. Those, she said, would eventually be the keys to getting our voices heard. I can't speak for my classmates, but I thought I was at the school because I'd faced a path of little struggle. According to my parents, I started reading at the age of three. By the age of nine, I was writing a terrible novel. Uh, sort of everything in the sphere of reading and writing, uh, except for school essays, came pretty naturally. Um, and so I thought I was working hard on writing. I thought I was committed to it. But then there came this new class and this new genre and Mamie and her telling us that we weren't working hard enough. It was a message I needed to hear, but I wasn't ready to hear it. I didn't respond in the best of ways. I conveniently ignored uh, a little quote she put in an email to us that said, you're in the safest, most idyllic intellectual space. Your daily problems are your blessings. I felt like my world was crashing down. I wanted to give up on the class. I wanted to give up on writing. I didn't feel like I belonged at a school that forced poetry down your throats. I mean, talk about inhumane torture. Um, and so in the middle of my anguish with about as much melodrama as I could drum up, I emailed my mother to tell her about the situation. And uh, I have some quotes from that to demonstrate my mindset. I went from the top of the mountain to the darkest valley I've walked through in 16 short years. I'm not happy with the person I've become. I've become a showman and I'm trying to save what little integrity I have left. And in this situation, there shouldn't be problems. I don't know why there are. If that sounds more like someone struggling with a really big problem, I don't know why that is. Poetry, for some reason, brought this out of me. And I was exaggerating my situation, but if you cut through the melodrama, there's a really crucial thing here. And it's that I was facing a turning point. And I had to decide whether what I had been doing was worth putting in more work to keep doing it. I was asking some questions about my identity as a writer. Did I want to keep working at it? Was it for me? What reward did I get out of it? Around this time, the reward of poetry began to become more tangible. Um, despite my moaning and crying, the skills Mamie was teaching us about curiosity and close reading and careful thought were working their way into my habits as I studied more poems she gave us in class and my own poems I was writing. And they started to reveal something that I hadn't seen before. And it was just this energy and emotion in the words that I could feel no matter when I was reading it, no matter under what conditions, it was always there. And I wanted to know how it had gotten there. It was the goal of every poet and eventually it would be the goal of myself in my own work to get that emotion in there. The first poem I found it with was Degrees of Grey in Phillipsburg. Um, I always come back to the first lines. I love them a lot. Uh, you might come here Sunday on a whim, say your life broke down, the last good kiss you had was years ago. Listen to the way those invite you into its world. There's no easing you in. It's you are here. This is who you are. That was really interesting to me. That's really where my journey into poetry began. Um, and it doesn't mean the obstacles and the confusion were gone, but I had a reason to pursue it. I had a reason to look past those obstacles. But even then, I was not seeing far enough into the future to know what poetry would bring me 
because nine months later, out of the blue, I got a call from Olivia Morgan on the behalf of the President's Committee on the Arts and Humanities to tell me I had been selected as the 2014 National Student Poet for the Southeast Region. Uh, the program was started by the President's Committee, also in partnership with the Alliance for Young Artists and Writers and the Institute of Museum and Library Services. And it was started a few years ago to select five student poets every year to bring them together and give them what they needed to become ambassadors of poetry, to spread what they knew of poetry, what they loved of poetry, to um, on a more national level. And um, we, we do that through community service projects, we do that through workshops, readings we attend, poetry festivals we attend, and these sort of things to get poetry more exposed. And People always ask me about the inaugural event, because I've usually seen this photo. Um, our inauguration was in September. We got to visit the White House and give a reading. Um, but to be honest, I don't remember much. I was, I'd just gotten off my first flight, uh, gone through an intense rehearsal the night before, probably didn't sleep. Um, and it's kind of a big jump, right? To go from one day bemoaning the agonies of poetry to nine months later, there's the first lady pinning something on your, on your collar and saying, here's a whole region of the United States. Go tell them about poetry. And how do you do that? You go to the rooftops and shout lines of poems to the world? Like, what do you do? Where do you start? Um, it took me a while to figure that out. Um, but what came in handy were those basic skills of poetry that Mamie had taught me at the very beginning. I was coming back to those again and again. Um, it took openness and curiosity to lead a workshop with high school age boys uh, in a, in a uh, rehabil rehabilitational facility um, who were teaching me things in their voices and their poems that I hadn't even considered. Um, it took another kind of openness to listen to the advice of poets like Paul Muldoon, Mark Doty, Elizabeth Alexander, and Claudia Rankin. Uh, because they're such esteemed great poets and they have so much to offer, you really can't let like, your own ego or your own ideas get in the way. And while I was listening to them, I was learning, but I was also hearing echoes of what Mamie had taught us way, way ahead, got us a huge head start. And it's a real testament to how much she was able to teach us in those nine short weeks that they kept coming up again and again, no matter where I was headed. But not everyone gets a Mamie Morgan. These skills were invaluable to me, and they must have been invaluable to others. So my whole goal through last year and moving forward is to spread poetry as much as I can because I know there are people out there who don't know yet, like me, who are stubborn about poetry or simply don't know it's an option or, or a viable option or anything like that. They don't know what poetry, what writing, what slam poetry, what spoken word can do for them. And so that's been the goal. These, the bottom line is poetry has given me access to ideas and friendships that I wouldn't have had otherwise. And why wouldn't I want everyone else to have access and opportunity in the same way? Um, this June, uh, the program traveled to Aspen, to the Aspen Ideas Festival, and we participated in the Aspen seminars where we were discussing uh, philosophical and uh, texts by Aristotle and Plato and other texts like Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham City Jail. Um, and these were like dense texts. It took a lot to get through them. Once again, Mamie's skills were coming back up, uh, researching what you didn't know, giving it a lot of, of your time and your effort. Um, we met with another group of student poets from Chicago, and though we were a diverse group meeting for the first time, we had a common language to share in poetry, and that helped a lot. We used poetry to guide us and inform us as we were sharing in each other's experiences, and that led to a big closeness in the group. Again, friendships I wouldn't have had without poetry. Um, I'm gonna wrap up here. I'd like to share a poem first um, that I wrote also junior year around the same time. 
uh, that I read Degrees of Gray in Phillipsburg in the same way that that poem was the first poem I read and felt that draw to poetry. This was the first poem I wrote and felt that same draw to see it to its end and its conclusion. So this is emptying my grandfather's house. We leave the dumpster crouching in the street, then haul armoires outside and crack them open like eggs. Splinters disappear in brown December lawns only because snow has missed Chicago so far, a warmer winter than my father has known since seven years old. Still, the marigolds are dying, and hypothermia will keep snakes from flaking through the basement when my father halts before a shelf and a workbench light flies across his peach peel forearm, one hand slack around a buzzing crowbar, the other embracing a pistol's muzzle, my grandfather's bronze souvenir of the Pacific Theater. I've learned to let my father stay dangerous because perhaps unloading a revolver is like stealing the pit from a blanched avocado. Only the rhythm of beating basement walls can stave away his whooping cough on a night like this, when the blue panels on the neighbor's house rattle like dogs drunk on scotch. And blinking in moonlight might overshadow his silver stubble and my alloyed breath. There's one thing I've taken away from my very brief journey with poetry so far. It's that there's a necessity to humble yourself to the hardship and confusion you might face. And there's merit in taking the path which has an end you can't see. Because committing to the unknown and giving it your best can lead you far past whatever horizon you set for yourself. Thank you.